So welcome everybody to uh, a podcast with Lanka Wildlife uh, featuring one of the greatest uh, taxonomists, living taxonomists of the world, Rohan Petiagoda, uh, on this day of the spring equinox uh, when, the equator, when the sun is on the equator and heading north. And it's also the new year in Persia. Um, so um, today we're going to be talking on the topic of um, are foreigners more interested in Sri Lanka's wildlife than locals? And the most important reference point that I have for this is Rohan's uh, wonderful book, Pearl Spices and Green Gold, which, which actually covers many of the issues uh, that, that I was thinking about raising when I brought this uh, topic up. I mean, in fact, it's like a, almost subconsciously, I've taken in everything that the introduction of uh, Pearl Spices and Green Gold by Rohan Petegut has to say, and I'm kind of just look, having, looking for more commentary about it. Um, so the thing is that it's very clear from this book that Sri Lanka has had a fine input from uh, researchers and taxonomists and explorers, uh, historically speaking. And the question is, um, even Rohan says in the book that uh, there are more foreigners in this book because research isn't necessarily in the blood of Sri Lanka. He, he makes a comment like that. So we're, we're just... Um, Picking up from historical roots, I mean, for thousands of years, Sri Lanka has been a, a hub for biodiversity work and uh, well, I mean, biodiversity exploitation, certainly, like when it comes to pearls and uh, uh, elephant tusks um, and possibly spices as well. Um, and then the Europeans start uh, looking for spices and coming in. So um, do you think that Sri Lanka has received a boost, Rohan? Hmm. Okay. Um, I'm not altogether comfortable with the way you present that idea, though, Rajita. Um, yes. the, 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 the thing is, we have to be careful when we identify groups like Sri Lankans and foreigners, because yes. usually the diversity within any group is much greater than the diversity between groups. Yes. Um, and interest in biodiversity can be driven by many factors. I mean, we know from the experience of the past half century when Sri Lanka's, during which Sri Lanka has become hugely more uh, affluent than it was uh, at the time of independence, that interest has grown enormously. And this could be due to a variety of factors. Um, for example, I have the example, for example, from ornithology. Um, in the late 1990s, I think about 1996, Sarath Kotagama and I decided that we should publish a bird watcher's guide to Sri Lanka in Singhala. And Sarath produced this volume in Singhala of almost 600 pages, a very detailed technical guide, which we quite hesitantly published in a thousand copies. Yes. And it sold out immediately. And at that time in the late 90s, ornithology was the province of middle-class uh, westernized English speaking uh, people in, in Sri Lanka. The, the, the masses as it were, hadn't, hadn't taken much of an interest in it. But the publication of that book, uh, which eventually went on to sell more than 20,000 copies, uh, so a sea change in, in interest in birds. And now it's quite common that you'd go to a, a place like Talangama where bird watchers go. I myself, I'm not a bird watcher, but I've been there and seen uh, of a morning. And you'd find young kids uh, 10 or 12 years old with a well-thumbed copy of that book speaking in Singhala and enjoying the bird life there. Um, so that is a cultural change, for example. There are other cultural changes that come with affluence. I think when people become better off, they take a greater interest in nature. This is something we've seen pretty much everywhere in the world. Um, and finally, there's perhaps also the, there's the possibility that our genes might have something to do with it. I mean, it's, it's uh, for example, this, I don't know if you've seen the literature on the dopamine receptor gene uh, D4, I haven't. There's an allele of that, the R7 allele, which um, correlates very closely with 
high risk taking aggression, searching for new experiences, what we call the explorer instinct. In Asia, it, the, the frequency is less than 2%. And in America, for example, it's about 50%. So 25%, 25 times more um, a higher incidence in the population of uh, an allele that uh, is correlated with, uh, with exploration. I've pointed out before, I think that in Singhala, the word for exploration is, is, uh, is just searching for cattle. Yeah. Gavation air means yeah. searching for cattle, literally. Yes. It is not exploration in the sense of going to the North Pole or climbing the highest mountain or swimming the biggest sea or something. This, this is very much a, a European construct. But I, I think it might be driven by multiple factors, which is why I worry about groups being defined in that way. But I, I, I know where you're coming from, so we'll, we'll go by that Well, yes, uh, it's deliberately, it's del Rohan, it's deliberately meant to be ever so slightly controversial. Uh, but, you, but we have had, uh, I mean, based on your book, uh, I believe um, that Linnea started uh, writing things from roughly about, shall we say, the 1770s, is that right? Uh, 1748 was Linnaeus. 1748. You seem to you you trace the exploration of Sri Lankan biodiversity to quite a quite a long time in antiquity to certainly to the 18th century at some point. It could be as as early as 17, 17, 17. You kind of actually given a date which I can't really pick up exactly right now. Well, but, the um, first exploration of plants uh, yes. began in about 1660 in um, Sri Lanka in Sri Lanka and by the late 1660s, uh, there was Paul Herman, a, a Dutch physician who made the first collection. Um, his volume was published in 1717. Yes. And then we had uh, Johannes Berman uh, publishing in 1737, Linnaeus in 1748. Um, and that that trajectory was carried on for the plants because plants were the things that were seen to be of commercial relevance. Yes. Thanks to thanks to uh, plants like cinnamon and black pepper, uh, which and cinnamon is was pretty much endemic to Sri Lanka. Yes. So we had this this tradition of looking for uh, looking at plants in Sri Lanka, and then yes. that was finally came to. Uh, fruition with the publication of uh, Henry Trimmon's uh, magnificent five volume um, handbook to the flora of Ceylon between 1893 and 1900 um, and updated more recently by uh, MD Dasanayaka and Fosberg. So the, the plants were always better explored. The, the animals didn't come to be nearly as well explored uh, and were always a province of amateurs, uh, apart from the marine biodiversity because of pearls. Yes. But apart from that, there was no serious attempt to investigate the animal diversity of, of Sri Lanka. Um, so we, ha we have to, uh, I think it's, it's got to be expl uh, explained to the audience that uh, generally speaking, tropical biodiversity has been highly sought after by, by exploring nations who, who never had enough of it themselves. I mean, in cold climate, we don't, there isn't really too much biodiversity, at least uh, during winter time. And so they're desperate for things like spices that Sri Lanka was providing probably since the Roman times. Um, so do you think that Sri Lanka had a, had a head start when it comes to other Southeast Asian countries or other Asian countries when it comes to bi biodiversity, diversity, di uh, my diversity research, thanks to thanks to these explorations. No, I think that was largely an accident. Um, the export of biodiversity products was commonplace throughout the tropical world, um, for the simple reason that materials were needed. Um, if you if you think about it, until the industrial revolution, pretty much all materials were biodiversity derived, whether it was wood or fur or fleece, um, food, pretty much everything. Um, so it, it's only in recent times that we've, we've stopped relying on wood for fuel, for example, and moved on to fossil fuels or other sustainable forms of energy. Uh, we've stopped relying on things like tortoise shell and ivory and whalebone for materials and moved on to plastics. Um, and so these 
these developments have been a much more recent thing in the history of, of humanity. And I don't think people were conscious of looking for biodiversity as such. They were just looking for materials or medicines in, in a very crude form. Um, and you must remember that even today, there's a huge demand for uh, herbal medicines, for example, from Chinese traditional uh, medicine. And uh, I'd say the vast majority of biodiversity utilization that is, is consciously uh, made in, in the world is, is for herbal medicines and herbals in general. Wouldn't you say that there was a desperate need amongst Europeans who didn't have it themselves for things like pepper and cinnamon and cardamom and various other spices? Of course, that was a, that was a major part of the, the, the trade. Um, but there were also other things that were going from Asia. I mean, uh, that were biodiversity related in, in other ways, like, like silk um, and cotton. Uh, pretty much everything until the Industrial Revolution had some connection with biodiversity, whether it was food or materials so or fuels so I, I think this is this is stating the obvious in a way that until quite recently biodiversity was what the, the whole world economy revolved around well the, the one of the advantages of uh, of foreign uh, research in sri lanka was that there were vast international collections amassed and the comparative method of comparing uh, the, the species from uh, one country compared to the species of another country established the high degree of endemicity of certain Sri Lankan forms. This kind of knowledge would not be possible, would it, without international collections or the kind of collections that were done? Always. I, I think uh, like in, in any field of study where materials are involved, you have to have uh, collections. Um, to, to make comparisons, to make analyses, uh, and, and so on. So in the absence of biodiversity collections, any kind of inventorizing of biodiversity is really completely impossible. Um, we, we can't really have an idea of end endemicity, for example, in Sri Lanka, unless we knew pretty much what was going on in India. And still, we have huge doubts about uh, endemism in Sri Lanka because the southeastern side of the Indian Peninsula uh, remains so poorly explored. In, in fish, the, the group I work in, for example, there's very few studies of the southeast uh, or the east draining uh, basins of the southern peninsula. So we've got no way of finding out whether the fish that occur there are also present in Sri Lanka or not. You're, you're referring there to the southeast of uh, India? The southeast Indian Peninsula, yes. Right, yes. like, uh, I don't know, uh... Andhra Pradesh, something like that. No, this 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 is Tamil Nadu. The, the Tamil, Nadu. Tamil Nadu goes all the way to the south of India. Yes. And there are there are rivers like the Vaigai and Tamiraparani, which have really not been properly explored. And we we suspect that many of the fishes that occur there might also occur in Sri Lanka and not be endemics as we think they are at the moment, because no one's looked in India. Yes. So um, at the late uh, during the later half of the Victorian period, there was a, a total craze uh, for collection. And uh, this is sort of uh, highlighted in your book, uh, Pearl, Spices and Green Gold, and also in similar books, uh, like for example, Richard Conniff's uh, The Species Seekers. Uh, it, it was a kind of almost like a badge of honor about um, collecting beetles and insects and all kinds of things. And it became pretty crazy before it started probably dying down after the 1930s and various, uh, the various wars that were taking place. Uh, world wars. Uh, and at a certain point, um, maybe after the 70s, uh, they introduced the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, um, what do you think was the reason that they that they introduced it? I mean, you see, I, I've got to get my head around it, and I haven't really, to be honest. So I, I think you've got to roll that back a little bit. Yes. Um, there, there was a perception amongst uh, both developed and developing countries, um, that huge benefits had been derived, for example, by pharmaceuticals companies as a result of exploiting tropical biodiversity. Um, there are, to be, to be fair, a, a few um, charismatic examples. Um, probably the best known is uh, Christine. A chemotherapy 
medication, which very effectively treats uh, Hodgkin's uh, disease and uh, several other cancers. And this is derived from a Madagascan, uh, the rosy periwinkle plant in Madagascar. Um, but the, and there was a feeling that properly explored the 400,000 species of flowering plants across the world, which are largely concentrated in the tropics, could yield thousands of hugely valuable pharmaceuticals. A myth also emerged in the late 1980s that um, re resulting from one book really that, that I don't think deliberately mis misrepresented the facts, but it, it had the effect of misrepresenting the fact that pointed out um, that of the top 25 pharmaceuticals in the world, which earned about 400 billion US dollars for the manufacturers, 11, almost half, were derived from biodiversity. Now, when you hear that statistic, you immediately think, wow, here's plants from the tropics making billions of dollars for multinational pharmaceuticals companies, and the, the tropics themselves are not getting any benefit from this. Yeah. And that was the narrative that was fed into the Convention of Biological Diversity. The fact is that of these 11 so-called multi-billion dollar pharmaceuticals, they were in fact derived from biodiversity, but it's not the kind of biodiversity that most people have in mind. Eight of them, including uh, the well-known statin drugs, which uh, control for cholesterol in, in humans. Eight of these multi-billion dollar drugs are, were derived from common fungi. For example, the fungus you find on wet boots or the fungus you find on rotting oranges. Now, these are not things to which any country will claim ownership because these are ubiquitous uh, organisms found all over the world and there's no sovereign ownership involved. Two of the 11 were from genetically modified ovarian cells uh, drawn from cattle and cattle also uh, not the province of any one country. So this, this myth has become widespread that when pharmaceuticals are manufactured or based on um, models found in nature that somehow this is associated with tropical biodiversity. But the fact is that of perhaps the 50 biggest uh, pharmaceuticals presently being sold in the world, not one is derived from any uh, plant or animal associated with the tropics. So, so this, is, this is largely uh, a myth, but the myth was ingrained. And the same year as the Biodiversity Convention was announced in 1992, there was a film, a now forgotten film, but starring Sean Connery called Medicine Man, where Sean Connery to cure an urgent cancer that was spreading across the world, goes in search of miracle plants in, in the tropics. And, and of course, finds this hugely valuable plant that solves the world's problems. Yeah. So, so people have been primed with this expectation. A myth had been fed into people that there was huge value in biodiversity, huge economic value in biodiversity waiting to be exploited. And that this almost infinite resource of plants and the genes they contain could make a huge difference in uh, developing countries in particular, exploiting these resources to their own financial gain. So it, it was a hugely, it was a, it was a massive lie, but I don't think it was a lie deliberately told. It was, a, it, it, it was just because people weren't thinking clearly. They'd all bought into this hype. Uh, and, and this movement, if you look back to the 90s, was a bit like the woke movement now. I don't want to go down that route yes, at all, yes. but I, I'm just saying that people sometimes run away with an idea without really thinking it through. And, and you, you, you see this happen in every generation. There's, there's one thing that takes hold and then very soon it loses its gloss. Yes. Um, and, and so the Biodiversity Convention sought to give countries the right to assert sovereign ownership of their, of their biodiversity. Um, and this was very attractive to post-colonial countries because they had had centuries in the case of Sri Lanka, four and a half centuries of foreign exploitation. A lot of people very worried about 
foreigners coming and taking what they own away from the country naturally after after that kind of experience and so the cbd gave them the first opportunity to assert absolute ownership over the resources they they controlled but the cbd was made also on another misapprehension which i, I think is even more elementary it advertised the fact that there were 400000 flowering plants in the world for example amongst other things which which is which when you consider the genetic composition of those plants is an almost infinite resource yeah. and they said this has got value but elementary economics shows that when a resource is infinite it has no value yes and and this is something that everybody missed and the few people like myself who stood up and said this is a bad idea don't subscribe to it obviously we were on the losing side 196 countries signed up to the cbd it, it, it pretty much every country in the world apart from i think the united states and a couple of others just signed on to this um, so, um yeah so rohan uh, uh, th there are two things i want to bring out of uh, what you've just said um there's this word that uh, that they have developed in well the journalists have come up with in sri lanka called biopiracy so this kind of perceived fault of uh, more developed countries exploiting the biodiversity of poorer countries uh, could that be described as biopiracy yes i mean if it, if it was done without the consent of the the donor country then that would be piracy so biopiracy is when the biological resources of a donor country are exploited by anyone without the consent of the donor and, um, and yeah rohan if i may can uh, just pause you and also the cpd was effectively opening a door to a, a system of copywriting if you like uh, a, a government owns the biodiversity and it's kind of copywriting it and you can't really use that without kind of acknowledging it or giving some kind of uh, royalty Yes, so the, the idea was that there would be agreements signed between people who wanted to use the biodiversity of a given country and, and that country, and that this would earn revenue to the countries with lots of biodiversity, like, like Sri Lanka, for example. But that, that was an absolute myth. But people bought into this because it was so sexy. The, the, the idea was that, that this was such a deliciously attractive idea, um, although it was empty. Um, uh, and Graham, can you can you think of a single country which has benefited from the CBD provisions like it was intended? For example, can you think of a country which gets royalties from some company or some institution uh, in exchange for them being allowed to use that country's biodiversity? Yes, but um, there are a, a handful of small small examples, but they're they're very small. Yes. Um, the perhaps the country that tried hardest to make this word work was Costa Rica, which has about, it's about the same size as Sri Lanka, but it has uh, many more species of plants. And they invited the global pharmaceuticals company Merck um, to come and exploit their, or investigate their, their flowering plants. And Merck set up a, an entity in San Jose in, in Costa Rica uh, with a local NGO, a very large NGO called INBIO, the, in, the National Institute of Biodiversity in, in Costa Rica. And they came to a profit sharing agreement with the government of Costa Rica and they said they're going to start investigating um, how uh, or looking for products of medicinal value uh, from Costa Rican plants. They ended up in the next 18 years um, assaying more than a hundred thousand plant derived chemicals. Yes. Not one of which offered any kind of um, commercial product. And eventually Merck was so frustrated by this that they not only suspended their pro program for looking for biodiversity based medicines, but they put that entire hundred thousand uh, the 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 assays were were made public property. They they it's still available to anyone to use as they want because obviously they saw that there's no commercial value in it. And soon after that, many other giant pharmaceuticals companies like Pfizer and Eli Lilly and Bristol Myers Squibb followed by by suspending their own programs to look at biodiversity. So this was a huge flash in the pan, and and the CBD never quite recovered from it because. 
the, the, now 25 years after the original convention was signed with much fanfare in Rio in 1992, it's become pretty worthless. And the damage that the CBD has done is enormous, as you pointed out, because many developing countries were led to believe that there were billions of dollars stored in their forests. In fact, there weren't. This, this was a, almost a con, except I, I believe that everyone who was involved in this was well-meaning. I mean, they, they were sincere in their intentions. It's just that they didn't see the unintended consequences of this action. Yes. So, Rohan, if I can point out uh, an actual incidence of so-called biopiracy, uh, when the British uh, uh, smuggled out tea uh, from China and cultivated it at Kew Gardens before reintroducing it to their colonies. It was a brilliant stroke of luck uh, after all that trouble with the opium wars and uh, having problems with access to Chinese tea. So they just decided to just grow it in, in their colonies. Uh, I mean, that was an act of biopiracy, biopiracy because they were actually smuggling plants out and China hasn't really benefited, benefited from these tea plantations, has it? Well, I not sure that that narrative is correct, Rajit, because um, there's there's some work done on the the tea, first first off there's no wild uh, tea population known yet, so Camellia sinensis the, the, is is a a plant of which no wild population is known. Now there is a there's Camellia sinensis, which is grown in Assam, and a, a, a slightly different cultivar grown in China. And these two are hugely separated in their genetics. It looks like they've been separated for more than 20,000 years. In other words, long before agriculture and long before cultivation. So this is not a plant that's endemic to China. It's a plant that occurs in, in northeastern India, in northern Burma, and also in southwestern China. So who owns it is a wide open question. And the British didn't need to go very far to get it because the, the in, India's got in, in Arunachal Pradesh, for example, Camellia assamensis, which is widely cultivated. And it looks like a, a genuinely uh, antique population that's been uh, there for a long time and exploited there for a long time. Well, I mean, uh, I, 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 I can go along with you. What about rubber? Now, rubber was uh, at some level smuggled out of uh, South America and transferred to Malaysia before it was introduced to Ceylon. I think that um, didn't, they, they, didn't they try to protect, protect rubber, the South American authorities to some extent? I mean, we, we probably don't know too many details, but at least roughly, approximately speaking. No, I think we have a fairly good idea of that. Um, the thing with rubber was that, of course, hevia, the, the, the plant from which rubber is extracted most commonly, uh, comes from Brazil. And the problem with the Brazilian hevia or hevia is that it can't be cultivated in Brazil. It grows wild, of course, in the Amazon rainforest, um, but it can't be cultivated in close, in, in high density uh, monocultures because it develops disease and dies. Yeah. So because of that, it had to be wild collected, which was really expensive to do because the, the density of trees was not very much. And people used to collect it uh, a bit like they used to collect cinnamon or pepper in Sri Lanka, which is basically go in the forest and look for them rather than cultivating them in massive monocultures. So Brazil was exporting rubber, wild collected rubber uh, from, if you think about it, I think certainly from the 1830s, from the time of Goodyear yes. um, to, to Europe for various types of um, materials applications. And the British were very keen, or the Europeans were very keen to try and cultivate Brazilian rubber in their own colonies so that they, they could have a bigger, a greater access to this resource. So in the 1870s, uh, Kew Gardens offered um, to pay for a shipment of Brazilian rubber seeds. And there was a guy called Henry Wickham, who was an adventurer, um, a British guy in, in, in Brazil. And he went out and collected 70,000 rubber seeds and he brought them to England and cashed them in for 700 pounds sterling, which at that time was a, was a considerable sum. 
And Wickham became quite a celebrity in consequence. He was also an attention seeker. Mm. And he wrote uh, the story of how he smuggled rubber out of Brazil and, and made this a very colorful story of piracy because he was the hero, he was the pirate yes. who, who helped the British empire by bringing this from Brazil. But that was largely a lie because the Brazilian authorities didn't object to the rubber seeds being taken out from Brazil. They were properly declared for customs purposes. This is well documented has been sent as biological samples to Q. So yeah. Th yeah. this was Wick Wickham's own, you know, um, song of praise to himself. Um, and then Q germinated, I think out of the 70,000 seeds, about 2,500 germinated. And the bulk of those plants, about 2,000 of those plants were in fact sent first to Sri Lanka because a few seeds have been uh, obtained over the years and, and germinated in Q. And they'd been sent to India, to Calcutta, for example, and to Singapore. But the journey, the, the voyage took too long to get to Singapore and Calcutta Botanic Garden couldn't get them to grow. So eventually the Kew Gardens turned to George uh, Thwaites, who was the director of the Peridinia Gardens in yeah. Sri Lanka in 1876, yeah. and asked him to set up a rubber nursery in Ceylon. Yes. And Thwaites selected a site near Gampaha at Henaratgoda, which is still a botanic garden. Yes. And these 2000 plants, plants were brought to Henaratgoda and uh, grown there very successfully. And um, they started, they came into seed about eight years later. And it was that seed that went to Malaysia and all wow. over the world to start the rubber plantations of the British Empire. Yeah, so so, the, um, so Sri Lanka yeah. was part of that story. So Rohan, uh, just, to, just to go off at a tangent, uh, re uh, recently uh, New Zealand, uh, I think it's New Zealand, has developed the so-called kiwi fruit and branded it as a kind of New Zealand fruit, whereas in fact the origin of the kiwi fruit is actually from, uh, I think from China or some from Southeast Asia somewhere. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of a country uh, turning something into its own, uh, uh, but it's actually coming from a foreign country. and. Fine. And furthermore, I mean, Chinese have recently been developing uh, malarial cures using their own herbal medicines like Artemisia or something. I, or I can't remember, but they've developed some herbal remedies to do with uh, malaria. Have they been trying to make some kind of copyright money for, for these uh, cures uh, by, uh, by, by asking for, well, anybody who's using these medicines to give them some kind of royalty? No, I don't think so. I, I think uh, artemisin is, is the one you're thinking of, yes. um, which is a very effective malaria cure, as is, as is quinine. Um, but neither Brazil nor Peru, from where the quinine tree comes, uh, uh, Sincona, um, have claimed any such rights. I mean, if you think about it, before tea was planted in the Ceylon Hills, yes. uh, it was uh, Sincona that was, was planted um, to make anti-malarials for the, for the empire. And um, it so happened that the Dutch in Indonesia could grow it more cheaply and more successfully there, which is why this, the Sri Lankan industry failed. But there's still a few uh, Sincona trees in Sri Lanka. In fact, I have one. Yeah. Um, and uh, they, they are the, 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 the trees that were brought in in the 1860s. Uh, to, to try and make yeah. in well, Sri Lanka. The point I'm trying to make, as you might pick up, uh, especially with reference to something like kiwi fruit, which are anything but kiwi, is that uh, countries are very countries that are that are quite good at gener generating sales from biodiversity from some or the other part of the world. It's very very difficult, isn't it, to develop copyright agreements to, uh, I mean, to use the CBD at an economic level to pay copy to to pay royalties to countries that originally had that kind of biodiversity. Oh, it, it doesn't work. And I think most countries have just given up on it. I mean, I, I told you earlier that uh, 196 countries signed up to the CBD, but when the Nagoya Protocol, which is the actual mechanism by which these agreements could be transacted for the exploitation of biological resources, when the Nagoya Protocol came along, um, many countries had realized by then in 2014, this was that um, sovereign, the assertion of sovereign right is meaningless and they, they just didn't bother to uh, sign up to the Nagoya. So right. out of, while 196 countries signed up to the CBD, only 130 signed up to Nagoya and very, I mean, 
including Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka didn't sign it. And neither did the USA or Canada or Australia or many other countries like Italy, Ireland, um, didn't sign up to the Nagoya Protocol. They just ignored it. Yes. And quite rightly, because this is, this is a waste of time. Yes. It's, it's just bureaucracy, uh, an operation run by, by lawyers and self-serving uh, in the extreme. I've, I've said publicly that I suspect that the cost of running the CBD secretariat in Canada is probably higher than all the benefit sharing agreements signed under the CBD worldwide since its inception in 1992, 25 years ago. Yes. So um, um, I'm confident that I'm right. Um, so, I mean, we have to remember that there are many, many other conventions that have been had a, had a powerfully beneficial effect, for example, CITES and many, many others. So the CBD seems to be one of these um, virtue signaling exercises that didn't necessarily do the job it was uh, it was it was meant to meant to cover, except maybe in another sense. I mean, you've just uh, I think it was you who wrote this article that you sent me the other day. You had written it in the FT about uh, about foreign taxonomists writing articles uh, about Sri Lankan wildlife without permission. Is that the aspect of the CBD that seems to apply now? Then, no, no, I, I don't think there's anything to stop people from writing. This is a I mean, the Sri Lankan constitution allows the freedom of uh, communication so people can write anything they want. It's the idea of uh, coming and collecting specimens in Sri Lanka and taking them overseas without permission, which is uh, the point at issue. And here again, different countries have different experiences. So countries that haven't had a colonial experience like Thailand and Japan and uh, Costa Rica, which I mentioned earlier, tend to be very liberal with access to their biological resources. Yeah. Countries that have a colonial background, like Indonesia, Sri Lanka, India, the Philippines, and Brazil, and so on, are much more touchy about this because people, uh, we're, we're only two generations in the post-colonial era, memories are still fresh, and people just don't want to feel that foreigners can come and exploit their, their country. This, this is a very sensitive issue. I don't think much harm is done actually by specimen collecting. When you, when you consider the, the harm that is done by collecting herbals, for example, for the traditional medicine um, yes. or forest produce of, of other kinds for traditional medicine, it's, it's much bigger, especially for Chinese traditional medicine. The impact is much greater. So, yeah, so Specimen collecting so tends to be very modest, but people are very touchy about it. The, the idea that someone can go into someone else's country and pick up what they want without permission is, is offensive to many Sri Lankans, and uh, I, I sympathize with that view. Well, I think that, that many, many taxonomists who I have talk, spoken to uh, agree that uh, that shouldn't be the case, that they, they ought to be able to get some kind of permission. Uh, mm -hmm. The thing is that in Sri Lanka, uh, we the country exports huge amounts of biodiversity uh, abroad, uh, you know, including plantation crops and fruits and herbs and marine fish and even uh, pet animals for the pet trade like uh, uh, freshwater fish. Uh, but if it comes to a researcher coming and uh, picking up a few uh, butterflies or something to write about, then, then they're not allowed to take. I have been told by one of the officials at the DWLC that uh, for research purposes, you're not allowed to take anything slightly bigger than an ant. You can't take it out of the country unless you're at some level going to bring it back. Well, that is the law. Um, and if people feel the law is unjust, then they can reform the law. But so long as the law exists and the wildlife department's job is to enforce that law, they have a duty to do that. Um, many countries have very similar laws. I mean, in Australia, where I am right now, um, the, the laws are very strict about what you can collect, what you can take out. Um, the difference, I think, is that they have strong institutions which can enforce those laws. In, in Sri Lanka, the institutions are inherently weak um, for, for many reasons, um, part, partly the colonial heritage, partly the fact that poorer countries tend to have weaker institutions, and partly because of uh, the challenges to democracy that are faced, where, where, for example, officials are frightened that politicians might overrule them or find fault with them. Uh, the approach is much more cautious. So I think you have to understand that this is a nuanced question. It's, it's not as cut and dry as you might think, because there are genuine sensitivities amongst the public about biological collections. They're, they're nervous about this. And I think those have to be assuaged by the, the scientists themselves.
Um, and I, I think the trend is changing. I, I cited in, in the article you mentioned, I, I cited two examples where the Wildlife Department had given permission in recent years, I think since 2016, for foreign people, foreign scientists to come and collect in Sri Lanka. One example was in Scorpions, I can't remember the other one, where they had come and made collections and, and published on them. So I, I think it can, it can happen. It's, it's a question of approaching it, right? Uh, I'm not saying the, the, the system is perfect, of course, it, th there would be flaws, but I, I certainly think that it's better to try and address the flaws and improve the system rather than scrapping it because some controls are obviously necessary because the broad majority of Sri Lankan people don't want to see any aspect of the country being exploited, uh, especially by, by non-Sri Lankan people. This, this is a, a thing that people are worried about because of the colonial past of the country and you have to yeah, factor yes. that in. Well, Rohan, I do agree with you, but don't you think that there's this huge disparity then between uh, exporting biodiversity uh, for, uh, this, this includes indigenous biodiversity like uh, the fishtail palm, you know, products pro produced by the fishtail palm. Isn't that a big um, contrast between se se sending, sending things, exporting things for economic, economic reasons versus doing things for scientific reasons? It's, I mean, like that's a kind of, maybe there's a slight overlap, but there's this huge contrast that anything that you can eat or sell, you, you kind of just export it in huge amounts. But if it's for research, well, it's too precious. We can't really allow you to have that. I think that comes from a different place, though, Rajat. I, I think the, the, there is in many countries and in many developing countries and also more and more in developed countries, a suspicion of science. I mean, the fact that even in the UK, some large proportion of workers in the National Health Service aren't willing to have the COVID vaccine is, is reflects the fact that they are suspicious of the science associated with that vaccine. Yeah. And, and in, in what would you expect in the developing world? So people are very suspicious of, of science and what scientists are doing. And scientists actually, myself included, haven't done enough to make people aware of what they're doing. And more and more now, I, I find scientists going on media, going on social media and television and writing to the newspapers about the things they're doing. And that attitude, the mindset will change as people become more aware of the benefits of doing these things. So I, I, I suspect the, the pendulum will swing in the other direction slowly, but it, it, it does need time because this is coming from a, a difficult place. When you, when you think about the way in which the country was exploited at, at one time. Um, if, you, if you remember, the, the, the Hevela Zoological Gardens, for example, uh, came to be established in 1936. But for the previous 50 years, from 1886 to 1936, is it 60 years? Yeah, 50 years. It, yeah. Was, it was a holding station for the export of live animals from Sri Lanka for zoos and collections overseas. Uh, it was started by John Hagenbeck, a, a German, and uh, the, the government came to own it in 1936, only when Hagenbeck uh, declared bankruptcy. Yeah. So for 50 years, the, the Hevela Zoological Gardens was busily exporting all manner of animals. And, and the collection was so big that it was open to the public as a zoo, though its primary function was the export of Sri Lankan animals. So, so, so but, but Rohan, uh, if I may uh, just backtrack ever so slightly, isn't there a sense in which certain parts of the Victorian, uh, the Victorian spectrum could be could be regarded as a kind of golden age for uh, nature exploration and descriptions of exploration and and huge amounts of biodiversity from Sri Lanka got onto the map uh, thanks to some of this uh, some of this collection collection work that went on without any kind of uh, obviously obstructions from things like the CBD. Sure. I, I, uh, a lot was done, um, and importantly, a lot was done by amateurs, because almost there was almost no contribution from from government. The as I as I mentioned earlier, the the main the the only notable uh, expedition that the government funded prior to independence was the Herdman expedition to the Gulf of Manai in, in 1900. Um, and just that one expedition by William Herdman, um, a marine biologist, had 
paid huge dividends. He, he published a report on the pearl oyster fisheries between 1903 and 1905, ran into about 1500 pages, and described 575 new species. I mean, the largest number of new species in one body of work in Sri Lanka's history. Uh, you know, a massive contribution to biodiversity science. And three of the people in Herdman's expedition went on to become really big movers of change. There was Nelson Annandale, who became director of the Indian Museum in Calcutta, yes. and two directors of the National Museum in Ceylon, uh, Arthur Willey and Joseph Pearson, were both members of that expedition. Huge consequences. And that yes. was the only project in which the government in, invested. Before then, it was private amateurs like uh, Frederick Kellart, um, Edward Green, uh, Johann Nietner. Uh, these were the people who made collections and published, and even they were hugely productive people. Wasn't Edward Green, Green was a employed, tea planter. Yeah, wasn't Green employed by the government as a kind of to do work, work on pests? Yes, he was eventually, because he happened to be a, a coffee planter and a tea planter in Pundaloya near Thalavakale, um, when the um, coffee blight happened and he identified the pest, Hemelia pestatrix, he identified the pest and because he was an amateur entomologist. And then he was hired by the government, he, so he abandoned planting and he became the government entomologist and uh, worked to find ways around or, or to, to treat the pest, but it wasn't successful because it, the challenge was too great. Uh, but Green went on uh, as an entomologist to write 420 papers. Mm. Now, P. P. Daraniagada is a lot better known than Edward Green, but yeah. Green's productivity was hugely great. It's just that he was involved in entomology and he was an amateur, he was a deep plant. Yes. And then yeah. with that background, when he went back to England, he became the president of the Royal Entomological Society as a complete amateur Sri Lankan tea plant who goes off and becomes president of the Royal Entomological Society in London. Yes. So outstanding amateurs. Frederick Kellart, as I mentioned, was also an amateur. So the first professional that really walked into this scene was P.E.P. P. Daraniagada, and he himself was trained as a marine biologist because that was the whole colonial government's uh, focus was the reviving the pearl fishery. You see, they were conscious of the fact that Dubai and Sharjah and Hormuz were producing pearls, and they wanted to revive the Sri Lankan pearl fishery because it had been so valuable in the past. Yes. And that would have happened if not for Mikimoto Kokichi, the, the, the Japanese guy who patented, I think in 1916, in the course of the First World War, who patented the method for culturing pearls. Yes. And that just took the bottom out of the pearl market in, in globally, because now you've got these beautiful cultured pearls which could be mass produced. And so while collected pearls, which were so expensive, um, were no longer in vogue. And so this, the, the fishery, the pearl fishery in the Ceylon and in the other countries I mentioned, just collapsed. Um, nowhere suffered more than Dubai, perhaps. And so it's, it's, it's a telling example of, of uh, enterprise of the people of Dubai that they, they have made such a hugely successful economy now from what was virtually a collapse in the 1920s. So so the, the CBD came in, in in the 1990s and it effectively put a put a stop to uh, scientific collections without getting adequate permission from the authorities, such as the Department for Wildlife Conservation. And uh, uh, there have been uh, lots and lots of negative negative uh, outcomes of this uh, for many, many- I, I need to correct you on that, yes. Radit, because the CBD didn't do anything by putting a stop to anything. Right, okay. It yes. just raised awareness yes. of, this, of this unrealistic economic value of biodiversity. So many countries stepped in to stop the exploration of biodiversity, the exploitation of biodiversity, because they felt that this resource needs to be maintained and exploited. It's like if someone comes and says, there's huge value in a mineral resource. The first thing the government would say is nobody shall touch it until we've, we've find, found out how much the resource is worth and how it can be exploited sustainably and over what period and what are we going to do with the money? So it was that kind of thing where, the, where governments all over the world just stepped in and said, stop everything because we can now find out how we can extract the maximum amount of money from this. Yes. But what they didn't see was the myth that this wasn't worth anything in financial terms. 
Yeah. Even today, we're not conserving biodiversity because it's worth money. We're conserving biodiversity because it means something to us. It's, it's part of our system of values, not yes. our economy. I, I mean, the and, one, yes, the one way in which something like the CBD has applied in an, at another level is, uh, for example, archaeology. So Egypt stopped sending any of its most valuable, wonderful treasures uh, so that foreign museums could exploit them and, and started uh, basically guarding them more carefully. But that doesn't apply quite, quite to the same extent with, with biodiversity, maybe. It's very different because if you're, if you're collecting ants, for example, in Sri Lanka, uh, out of uh, a few hundred million uh, ants in a species, you might collect 20. Yes. But if you take one uh, sarcophagus from Egypt, that's the only one they have. So yeah. it's, it's a very different thing. I mean, this is, this is a hugely more relevant and immediate part of a, a heritage of a country than, than sampling. Uh, species. So it's, it's very unusual that uh, scientific collecting should lead to the demise of a species. This is something that's never happened. So, so, because when a species yeah. is that rare, it's very difficult to collect anyway. So, so Rohan, you, you, you would acknowledge that the that, that CBD has, has put a lot of barriers against uh, uh, researching the biodiversity of Sri Lanka. For example, Fred Nags, a, a snail worker in London, had difficulties in getting a few uh, a few uh, specimens of uh, the uh, African land snail, which is an introduced species in, in, in Sri Lanka while he was doing a parasitic study. As countless examples from my own experience doing uh, working on squirrels or uh, bat research by the ROM, uh, still struggling to get permission to take out wing punctures. Countless examples and also local researchers working on local fish who are having problems getting permission. So there are problems with the, with the way that the CBD is currently interpreted out there? Yes, I'm sure there are problems, but there's also a, a lot of research that is permitted. I mean, uh, my, my own experience has been, my, my, my re most recent uh, student or colleague or collaborator, uh, Hiranya, for example, had no problem getting his permits from the wildlife department. They supported him to get permits for about six years. He was able to collect pretty much all the fish he was studying everywhere in the country. Um, there was no influence involved in that very transparently, I, maybe not as quickly as you'd want, but uh, he, he was given all the permits he needed. My colleague Madhava Migas Kumbura has been given permits to work on uh, amphibians. I myself have been given permits to work on pretty much everything over the years for the last 20 or 30 years. I haven't asked for a permit maybe for the last 20 because I'm, I'm not actively working in Sri Lanka any longer. Um, but I, I, and as I told you from two recent examples, foreign scientists who want to make collections in Sri Lanka, I, I cited the, the, the permit numbers have been given permission by the Department of Wildlife Conservation. So things are improving. So I, I think things will improve. It's, it's just that it takes time because it's going to be a while before the establishment in Sri Lanka realizes that we were all taken for a ride by this CBD mechanism and that, that this was a farce. Um, it's, when, when you think about it, we still go for the conference of parties meetings every year or two years that the CBD has, that the government's participating in the CBD process. And I, it, it'll be a while before people realize that this, is, this was a mistake. I can't ever see us withdrawing from the CBD because it's just sitting there and no one's doing anything about it except for maybe the officials who are interested in, in you know, writing new laws or new conventions or something. But the, the thing is, I, I, I wouldn't denigrate a convention like that because similar conventions, as you pointed out, have, uh, have been of huge value. I mean, the, the Montreal Protocol, for example, okay. yes. um, has, has transformed what was going to be a serious global problem. So I think these multilateral conventions have huge value in solving global problems. I, I don't doubt that for a minute. So, so it's Rohan, just that the CBD allowed itself to be misled by a, a lot of false propaganda, and it was deliciously um, attractive. That, that was the problem. I mean, when, when you have Sean Connery out there uh, telling you how to save humanity by looking for forest plants, people buy into that narrative very seductively. Uh, yes, at the moment, uh, Rohan, on, on a practical point, do they actually allow uh, species to be exported and, and, for example, to be 
uh, on a shared basis. So for example, uh, let's take a species of uh, insect or something. Do they allow uh, um, several, I mean, 10 specimens of a certain insect to be, uh, to be taken permanently uh, to a museum in a foreign country, possibly in exchange for similar insects that might be given to a local museum. Do they actually allow that legally now in certain situations? I believe so. I mean, uh, that's why I, I mentioned that the article I published last week uh, gave two examples that I've, I look for in the literature. I have no information on this from the wildlife department because I really haven't asked them about it. Um, but I'm sure I, I could if it, if, it, if it was relevant. Um, but I gave two examples of cases in which they had given permission for specimens to be collected and taken away for study in, in other countries. I mean, uh, if I can, uh, like the Serendib scops owl, uh, the holotype, I believe, was uh, they allowed it to be exported, uh, but it had to be returned back to the island. I wonder mm -hmm. if there are any other, I don't think that at the moment there are any, uh, any other specimens of, uh, of, 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 the, of the owl, partly because there are so few of them in any foreign, foreign collection. But this puts the one in, uh, housed in, uh, in, in Sri Lanka at, at great risk, isn't it? Because it's the only one there. Well, I'm not sure you can say it's a great risk because the, the, the other thing to remember is that our museum also has come a long way. Okay. Um, so, so this is, I'm, I'm going to take a minute to try and explain why I'm saying that. When the museum was established in 1877, it looked mainly at ethnography, ethnology, archaeology, and the, the focus laid largely on the, the national heritage of Sri Lanka. Also, what the museum contained then were the remnants after the best things had been taken to the British Museum. Yes. If you think about the title of the, the Ceylon Museum's journal, Spolia Zelanica, Spolia in Latin means spoils. Yeah. It's things you take away from someone by force. Right. That's what spolia means. This was unashamedly a extractive enterprise. And that was where the museum had its beginnings. The museum first got its foot into, national, uh, into natural history because of marine biology. That, that was the, the focus. Marine biology was the focus that the museum got because of the pearl fishery. And until Daraniagara in 1929-ish, marine biology was the primary objective of the museum as far as natural history was concerned. It had, it had no other uh, field of interest in natural history. The, there were people like uh, GM Henry who worked there uh, on some kind of entomological work. There were people like Bill Phillips who worked on mammals, but they were amateurs working at the museum. The, the government was paying the museum to do marine biology. And it was only after independence that the idea of making collections at a wider scale, a kind of biodiversity survey for Sri Lanka started happening. Um, that's, that was a very recent thing. So the museum's natural history arm was hugely neglected from the outset, from 1877, pretty much until about 10 or 15 years ago. Right. Now the museum has turned a new leaf and shown huge interest in natural history. Now it's, it's a pleasure to walk into the natural history section of the Colombo Museum because there's new microscopes, the specimens are kept in air conditioned conditions, the, the specimen jars are nightly, nicely labeled, at least as far as the fish are concerned, beautifully done. And I think the same could be said for the amphibians. I haven't looked at other groups, so I don't know. So the museums come a long way as well. And now there's, if not collections building and accumulation of new collections, which I think they should be doing as well, but they, they're not yet. At least what is there is well looked after. And in this age of genetics, I don't think you need to have large series of specimens of valuable species like uh, the scops are. I think one specimen and uh, a whole genome published somewhere is about all you would need. So, so this, is, this is not, uh, I think, an urgent problem. Uh, but uh, Rohan, you have been critical about the, uh, the CBD and, and the interpretation of it, uh, at least uh, certainly from about 10 years ago when lots of taxonomists were having problems. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm glad to hear that things could be improving now. Um, you, you make a provision, you say in your article that uh, hopefully uh, things will move in the direction of uh, the Philippines and Malaysia uh, to, to, make, uh, to, to improve the situation. What, what do you mean by that? 
So first off, I just want to explain that I was a, a critic of the CBD from the get-go, from 1992 onwards. Yes. I, I felt that this was a bad idea, that no good could come of it, and I was right. I wasn't popular for saying this, and I made a lot of enemies for criticizing the CBD in the early days, because if you criticize the CBD, it meant that you were supporting what they were calling biopiracy and so on. Yes. So as a result of my criticizing the CBD in the 1990s and early 2000s, I became a kind of pariah amongst many of the conservation NGOs like the Wildlife and Nature Protection Society and the Environmental Foundation, even though posterity shows that I was right yes. because they've all dropped that narrative now. Um, so, so that's something I think to, to just set the record straight on that. Um, as, as far as the examples I gave about the Philippines, Indonesia and Malaysia were concerned, these are cases in which illegally exported specimens or illegally obtained specimens have been the foundation of scientific papers in international journals. And those governments wrote to those journals and asked for those papers to be retracted. And yeah. I gave, I think, two examples where those papers were in fact retracted. This was all in, in the course of the last six months. Yeah. And this is one way in which governments could react to illegally collected specimens, that they could insist that journals retract the papers. Now, you know, as a scientist, that a retraction is, is, a, is the biggest blow to your career you can get. Right. right. And that's probably a bigger punishment than putting someone in prison for a week or two. Yeah. Um, so, so I think chasing retractions is something that more and more developing country governments are going to be doing in the course of the next year or two um, as, as a way of getting even with people who have come and stolen specimens. Because these stolen specimens are hugely controversial as well. In that article, I, I published a photograph of uh, a species of uh, grasshopper, Cladonotus, yes. uh, illegally collected in Singharaja. Now, in the paper that published the description of that new species, um, it, it said that the specimen would be deposited in the Natural History Museum in Bonn, in Germany. Yes. However, the museum in Bonn says the specimen was never deposited with them and could not be deposited with them because they would ask for documentation from the person making the deposit that it was legally collected and exported from Sri Lanka. And obviously the, the scientist in question cannot provide the documentation. So this means that this uh, specimen might disappear. So I took the initiative in, I'm just giving you this one example, yes. Yes. where I found the name of the collector, a German, uh, guy who'd made the collection in Singaraja, I called him up and I spoke with him. We spoke for almost one hour. Yeah. Um, I was trying to understand where he was coming from and I tried to explain where I was coming from so that he would understand why what he had done was wrong and yeah. I could try and explain the Sri Lankan concern to him. Just as a citizen, I called him up and we had a really productive conversation. He'd come to Sri Lanka out of all things for an IUCN meeting. Yeah. And he'd gone on tourism to Singaraja. He'd been staying at a forest lodge there, found the grasshopper in the forest of joining the, the forest lodge and thought it was really weird because it's a funny looking grasshopper, as you can see from that picture, yeah. and put it in his pocket. Yes. Took it back to Germany, looked up people studying that group of animals and mailed it off to somebody who was, who was working on grasshoppers. Yes. Um, <clears throat> It's not an earth shattering act of biopiracy. This wasn't, this wasn't a, a, a criminal person. It was a good person who did something wrong, knowingly or unknowingly, um, for a good reason, because he was interested in having this weird animal identified. He didn't even know it was new because he's not a, a specialist in orthoptera. So, you know, bad things happen for that kind of reason, but it's still the duty of the scientist making the description yes. to find out, was the specimen legally acquired? If it wasn't legally acquired, he should legalize it. Yes. So I spoke, to, I spoke to them and said, look, can you return this specimen now to the National Museum in Sri Lanka? So I spoke to the curator of entomology at the National Museum, and this was all in the last two months, maybe. I spoke to the curator and said, if this specimen comes back to you from Germany, will you accept it? No questions asked. And they said, yes, we will, yes. We will definitely accept it and respect it as a holotype and accession it in our collection. Yes. And the German team promised to send it, but to my knowledge, they have not sent it up to now. 
I suspect the problem is that to export that specimen from Germany, they would again need paperwork to show that it was imported legally. Yes. So, so that's probably got itself stuck so, in a hopeless so, place. So, Rohan, we have looked at uh, issues in the past, uh, and we don't want to get negative, whether CBD uh, interpretation or this is how I see it as a, as an interpretation of the CBD it could be another. Basically, it's the law. Uh, like for example, a tourist is rescuing a a, a freshwater uh, a freshwater frog uh, that has fallen into the seawater, and he gets arrested, or, or somebody's uh, somebody's trying to look after the, a baby squirrel that they have found and uh, who happens to be foreign, and they get arrested, or they could they they could they realize that they could get get into trouble for doing that kind of thing. Um, this kind of uh, banning people from looking after wild animals or uh, but because it belongs to the government after all it's kind of sort of belonging to the government it's, isn't that isn't that a bad attitude yes i mean that the law is bad there's there's no question a, a person of goodwill i had a similar experience myself uh, driving uh, from Avisavala to Colombo, somewhere around Hangwalla, the car in front of us uh, ran over a leaf monkey which was crossing the road yes. and the monkey obviously had a leg broken and was unable to move but it was still alive and I stopped and I thought I should pick this animal up and take it to the zoo and I thought about it and I decided against it because I thought the law doesn't allow you to do that by by taking that monkey in my car I was opening myself up to a five-year prison sentence by some crazy magistrate somewhere yeah so I, I drove away but that 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 incident has haunted me to this day we had another ex similar experience in Agrapatana where my field station was where the local village had killed a barking deer in hunting for, for food yes. and found two babies. And they brought the two babies to uh, me and said, would we like to bring the babies up because they couldn't, they didn't have the heart to eat the baby barking deer. They, they were very young, still not weaned. Yeah. Um, and I had to say, no, I don't want them. So they took them away and ate them because it was illegal for me to keep the, the barking deer. So I think probably hundreds or thousands of Sri Lankans have had similarly heart-wrenching experiences because the law is bad. The law has been unthoughtfully crafted. But the thing is, when the law is there, we have to respect it. We can, we can agitate to change the law, but to disobey the law is, is another matter altogether, and we shouldn't do that. Yes. So, so we're acknowledging that maybe there could be, a, in a kind of utopian situation, uh, uh, well, a, a, a situation where the scientists come in and they collect animals legally and there can be uh, some of the specimens can be moved into a foreign museum and, and stored there and there could be some kind of specimen exchange and some some sort of uh, exchange of knowledge and students or expertise uh, curatorial experts curatorial expertise so that better things can happen in other words uh, and maybe they're already happening now I think better things can happen, but unfortunately, <clears throat> the, the the people whose job it is to agitate for change um, tend tend to have a very short attention span. In uh, two thousand and two, uh, we had a, a fantastic offer of about twenty two million US dollars to set up a National Institute of Biodiversity. Uh, which I was spearheading because I, it was my job to go and find the money. And there were many donors, including the Global Environment Fund, the Netherlands government, uh, USAID, Conservation International, and so on, who formed a consortium to put together this fund to set up a National Biodiversity Institute for Sri Lanka. The opposition to that institute came entirely from nature NGOs because that was in the wake of the CBD. And because of my opposition to the CBD, I was seen as having some kind of nefarious agenda for setting up an institution like this. Um, because the CBD was the good thing. I was against the CBD, therefore I was necessarily a bad person. And any institution I was setting up would be aimed at pirating something from Sri Lanka. And the suspicion that I had attracted by then, which I didn't quite come to appreciate until much later, meant that pretty much every environmental NGO lined up against this and shot it down. Um, and Sri Lanka lost that money. Eventually, it went to India, uh, which is which is a horrible irony. Um, and the Indians set up some very successful institutions from it. And, and the money is still doing great things in India. Yes. So, yes. so yes. we've lost opportunities as a result of this. But I think mistakes were made on all sides. I, I probably myself have been too outspoken 
on these issues. If I took a soft line against the CBD at the time, it might have helped. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think yeah, so Rohan, um, right in now, retrospect, these yes. things can, could have been done differently. Right, right now, the government has been accused of uh, equal side, as it were. Uh, and you know the government is burdened by debt and COVID and all kinds of problems, international problems, domestic problems, and uh, it's it's not really. I mean, they're damned if they do, damned if they if they don't. When it comes to environmental things, uh, so under these circumstances, isn't it useful for us to have uh, a certain amount of foreign input? I can't see why. What's the relevance? I'm just trying to work because the the, the general attitude right now is that when foreigners come to do work on our biodiversity that could be biopiracy that's that's the point i'm trying to make but suppose there was a kind of constructive input from uh, museums or um, international bodies that actually want to play a role in helping to conserve sri lankan biodiversity isn't that a good thing yes co conservation is very different from making collections uh, well, I, think... I mean are they, are they a little bit more connected i mean for example by doing some research on a certain kind of organism and making publications about it, it becomes very famous or popular or, or hits the news and hitting the news could be a route to more conservation. I don't think that's really a sustainable outcome, Roger. I'm, I'm not convinced that that's the way to go. If I were, if you were designing a national policy on this matter, I don't think that's what you would prioritize. Yes. I would prioritize institutional strengthening. Yes. What we do need in Sri Lanka are, is a strong institution that looks at biodiversity conservation and exploration. The Indians set up this institution, which wasn't successful a long time ago, called the Zoological Survey of India, which, uh, which had the job of you know, surveying and inventorizing the nation's biodiversity, an impossible task. Yes. It's been around for about a century, but hasn't got very far. Um, but on, on those lines, I think we need a national institution for biodiversity. And then that institution could build up the multilateral or international collaborations that are necessary, recruit Sri Lankan students and researchers and postdocs and so on to work in it. And there are institutions like this in India. I mean, uh, a really nice institution is the Ashoka Trust for the Environment, uh, ATRI in Bangalore, which does some fantastic work. And now the Indian Institute of Science has got branches in places like uh, Trivandrum, which yes. uh, are doing fantastic work. So the, the Indians have, have gone ahead of us on this and, and Sri Lanka is still languishing on this. I think part of the reason is because our scientific community hasn't engaged closely with government in a meaningful way, um, <clears throat> unfortunately. And our NGO sector is hugely under-resourced. Yeah. There's very few scientists uh, associated with environmental NGOs in Sri Lanka. It's still very much a, a home science kind of approach to environmentalism. Um, and NGOs, I think, have also got a bad rap with government because they oppose pretty much everything. You have to choose your battles wisely. And if you just become uh, used to the idea that you just say no to everything, then the government doesn't take you seriously. You refer to local NGOs. I, I, refer, I refer to all NGOs. All, all NGOs. Yes. Operating in, in Sri Lanka. Yes. But the kind of damage that even international NGOs do, I mean, the kind of damage Greenpeace has done, for example, on issues like uh, pesticides and um, genetically modified crops and yes. the, the, the new CRISPR technology and so on, is huge. So it's, it's not restricted to Sri Lankan NGOs, but I think the NGO sector in general, by, by going too far in one direction, drives the government to dig its feet in, in the other. Which is which is not good. Uh, Rohan, you uh, you kind of agree that more foreign collaboration with regards to Sri Lankan biodiversity, however it's done or or, you know, or interpreted. I mean, for example, it could be filming, uh, allowing to be allowing wildlife to be filmed. It could be research, or it could be. Uh, I'm not really going to worry about too much about economic uh, research or something. But what I'm trying to say is that couldn't we dream of a, of a world where where maybe like with Thailand. I mean, there's Jody Rowling in Australia who does a lot of work on Southeast Asian frogs. Uh, would, it, would Sri Lanka benefit from a Jody Rowling kind of character coming and looking at our frogs? I mean, you've already done a huge amount of work on frogs. What do you have to say about some kind of Jody Rowling? Yes, certainly. Treatment? Certainly. I mean, we, we've got, uh, we, we definitely need international collaboration uh, at, at the widest level. And I, I think those, those are things that we, we need to push uh, well into the future. 
Um, <clears throat> but the thing is, we've had programs like that that have worked really well as well, and we don't stop to recognize them. Yes. If you think about, for example, um, the, the academic lineage that led from WWA Phillips in, in the 1930s to the present, um, I'll just give you that example quickly. You had Bill Phillips making a great survey of Sri Lankan mammals, writing a book in 1935, The Mammals of, of Ceylon. Yeah. Um, and Bill Phillips transferred, if you like, that legacy onto Osman Hill, who was a remarkable man. Osman Hill was became professor of anatomy in the Colombo Medical Faculty when he was 29 or 28. Yes an outstanding scientist, a primatologist. And he then took over the mantle of primate studies in Sri Lanka. He went on, when he went back to Europe, he went on to mentor Jane Goodall um, and as, as a student. And that's how the whole uh, Gombe chimpanzee initiative took off, which is still going strong. Yes. And in Sri Lanka, we had in 1960, Suzanne Ripley coming and starting a project in Polon Narua. Now, Suzanne Ripley's project, which started, what, now 60 years ago, is still going under the stewardship of Wolfgang Werner. Yes, yes. Wolf, sorry, Wolfgang Dittes. Wolfgang Dittes. And, and so for 60 years, that project has been hugely successful. Countless research publications have come from it. The, the Polonaru and macaques are probably the best studied primates in the world, apart from humans. That we, we know so much about them from this study. And these are foreign people who are working in Sri Lanka producing frontline science. Yes. So it, it can be done if you do it right. It's just that there have been bad experiences as well. So, so we, have to, we have to learn how to do it right. We have to learn from these successful examples and see how can we translate that into other fields of inquiry. And I, I think that can be done very successfully. It's just a question of having the patience to work through the system to do it. We won't get instant answers. But I think by patiently working with institutions like the Forest Department and the Department of Wildlife Conservation, you can bring about change. I, I know this from personal experience. And Rohan, you would can that bring be, about change yes, very Rohan, successfully. Would there be economic benefits to, benefits from this? Because at the moment, uh, I mean, the government is uh, described as the authorities. They, they're expected to solve all the problems in the country, and they really don't have the resources at all uh, to deal with all these problems. So under these circumstances, wouldn't this kind of uh, engagement with the outside world or the greater engagement or the di a move movement in that direction, wouldn't it lead to economic benefits because there will be lots of foreign money coming in to help deal with some of these conservation problems? It might be, but on the other hand, government institutions are also nervous because there have been so many instances where foreign people have come and made illegal collections in Sri Lanka. Some of them have got caught and arrested. I know of arrests that have happened in Singaraja and Horton Plains, multiple occasions. And as I myself point out, just having looked at the literature, the scientific literature from 2014 to now in the last six years, there have been about 30 papers that I, I found where specimens have been illegally collected and taken out of Sri Lanka. This is what I would call a commonplace practice now. So for scientists to be able to paint themselves as good people, some reform needs to happen from their side as well. You can't expect the government to open the door to scientists and say, come in and research when you've been a bunch of thieves up to now. So I think that there needs to be shifts on both sides of this divide. I don't think the fault is entirely that of the government institutions. I don't think the government itself, meaning the cabinet of ministers has got a, has got a opinion on this because this is something that wouldn't ever come to their attention. But I think the wildlife department, which is responsible for policy in this in this field, uh, would feel a lot more comfortable about being having a more liberal permit agenda uh, and mechanism if only foreigners behaved a bit better themselves. Yes. And this needs to be this needs to change as well. So I can see the frustration among scientists, but that frustration has to be assuaged through legal means. You cannot do what's illegal. Yeah. And, and insist that you have a right to do it. You don't, because the country has a right, a sovereign right to make its own laws and you can't override those laws. So, so uh, to come back to the part, the proposition that we started this conversation with, um, foreign nationals have always been very interested in Sri Lankan wildlife. And there are many, many locals who are interested as well. Some people say that, well, obviously uh, for, uh, we can't really say that foreigners are more interested in Sri Lankan biodiversity than locals, but 
but they do say that, well, the government doesn't seem to be interested in the biodiversity. Uh, so, so I mean, to cut a long story short, uh, no, foreigners aren't interested in Sri Lankan biodiversity compared to locals, but the government in Sri Lanka doesn't seem to care. Is that, is that, is that fair or not? I don't think that's fair at all. Okay. I think, I think a government is a fair reflection of its people in a, in a democracy. Um, and the, the people have got their own opinions on, on issues of biodiversity. Science doesn't rank very high on that agenda up to now. That's up to us scientists to change. I don't think you can blame the people for that because it's, it's our job to, to educate them um, and, and to, to, to change things. I think this, the, the CBD did enormous damage. It's going to take another generation perhaps to undo that damage or at least make people aware that this was a bad idea. Um, and to look at this as a foreign local kind of divide is something I'm not at all happy about as I told you at the beginning. The differences within groups of foreigners is probably much bigger than differences between foreigners and Sri Lankans as a whole. So this, this group thinking, I think, is not really relevant. Science is important. Science needs to be promoted. Who does the science is not really that interesting uh, a question. But it's, if, if the science is best done by Sri Lankans, then so be it. Sri Lankans should do it. And we've got some outstanding Sri Lankan scientists. I mean, look at the work that people like Suresh Benjamin have done on, on arachnids Spider. in Sri Lanka. Yes. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. So, so Rahan, and, yes. But when and, I and so it, it can be done in Sri Lanka is my point. And, and they, have, I, they have really good international collaborations and they, and they do fantastic work. Well, when I did the, when I created that proposition, it was simply to point out that actually foreign collaboration is a very, very good thing. And you would agree, wouldn't you, generally? Definitely. I mean, yes. If it was done the proper way. Well, I think collaboration is a good thing. If it so happens that you're collaborating with foreigners. I, I think I haven't, if, you, if I look through my list of publications, I, there's very few papers I have written on my own. Now, most people would see that as a, as a bad thing, but I like to have a collegial environment in what I write and what I publish. I enjoy helping other authors who are taking a lead in a research project to help them to publish a better paper. So I think collegiality and collaboration is very important in science in and, general. Yes, and Rohan, maybe- It doesn't matter so much whether people are foreign or Sri Lankan. This, this is really not an interesting question. So, so maybe we have to steer the authorities in charge, in charge of uh, the Sri Lankan biodiversity in the right direction, because that could also have economic benefits and take away the burden of, of the enormous financial cost of trying to look after the local wildlife. Yes, I, I think you have to engage with them. The Department of Wildlife every year has a, a symposium called Wild Lanka. Yeah. Wild Lanka is, uh, it's, it's I think going to be on the 6th of April is the next one coming up. Um, and they, they publish these, the, the, the presentations made at Wild Lanka. I see very few Sri Lankan scientists, the ones who complain, uh, coming and making presentations at those places. That's the place you have to engage with the staff of the wildlife department. They're all there and you have a chance to make your case on things like collecting. So it's, this is not the right forum for us to, to criticize. I think when, when you want to make change, you must engage with the people you, whose hearts and minds you want to change. Yes. And, and that is the most effective way of doing it. So Rahat, that's my experience having, having worked in government for pretty much all my life. I, I think people have changed my mind much more often by, by engagement rather than being combative. Uh, so this has been uh, quite a long podcast because of uh, because we want to well I wanted to get my teeth into the CBD um, CBD business and hopefully we we can avoid talking too much about the CBD in any kind of future meeting. Um, any final thoughts uh, before before I close about how things could could be improved with the, I mean with the current situation and um, accusations of ecocide? Well. <clears throat> If you look at the way in which these mRNA COVID vaccines are made, for example, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, they're both biodiversity based. They both use E. coli bacteria, Escherichia coli bacteria, which are ubiquitous in the guts of mammals to synthesize DNA. Uh, and they grow the DNA in these E. coli. Yes. What more profound use of biodiversity can you have in the immediate context of curbing a global pandemic. Biodiversity is, is hugely important. The exploitation of biodiversity for the betterment of humans is hugely important. And, and I think our future con conversation needs to be how to do that more efficiently and in a way that people understand. This, this is, it's, it's, the challenge before us is, is us scientists communicating more effectively 
uh, to the people whom we serve. And, and you think that things could be moving in the right direction based on that article that you have written now? I'm certainly trying to move them in the right direction. Yes. yes. Thank you very much, uh, Rohan, for your time and your patience. Thank you. Anytime. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye.